Is it a possibility that there are two shooters based on the data you collected? It just indicated there was movement. So one explanation of this data would be two shooters. <coughs> one explanation, not the, but one. Not the only one. Yeah, not the only one. But it is a reasonable explanation, just like one shooter running up that way, correct? Sure. Remember that from earlier on in the case, the two-shooter theory, Dick Harputlian uh, hitting it there with one of the prosecution's witnesses on cross-examination. Welcome back, folks. We are live at the Colleton County Courthouse, Walterboro, South Carolina. Behind me is where it's all happening. It's the biggest trial in the nation, and this thing is drawing to a conclusion. It's going to take a little bit more time, but we will be here on the ground until a verdict is reached. So tonight here in our bonus hour of closing arguments, we're putting together some of the pieces, connecting the dots for you. Now, Dick Harputlian it, it has talked a lot about these two shooters today. They bring in an expert to talk about that as well. It's important because if there's two people there, then it's not Alec Murdoch. It's, it's someone else for some other reason. And if it's a reasonable explanation for what happened to Paul and Maggie, if it's reasonable for this jury to believe that, hey, it could have been two, not one, he walks. Let's take a listen. Here's Dick Harputlian in his opening statement. He would have had to have executed both of them, got back up to the house, got the bloody clothes off. And by the way, they seized his clothes from that night. They never searched his house for any other clothes that we know of. Although that night, he gave permission and they got a search warrant. Go to my house, go look through everything. Where are the bloody clothes? Where are the bloody clothes? And of course, <clears throat> I would tell you that they've we woven this story together because they want everything to be consistent. What's important about that is the judge, and, and, and by the way, there's no eyewitness. There's no forensics tying him to the murder. When I say forensics, fingerprints, blood, whatever, tying him to shooting anybody that night. The cell phone records would indicate he would have had less than 10 minutes to kill him, get up to the house, get in the car and crank it up. He'd be covered in blood. Now, if they think he was beginning to establish an alibi, there's no evidence of that. The evidence is consistent with him seeing them earlier at the dog pen. And by the way, that, that audio they have of him and Maggie, they're, they're talking about one of the dogs killing a chicken. And they were debating whether it was a guinea hen or a chicken. No animosity, very normal discussion. Paul's very happy. And we know that Paul, after that, is texting back and forth with a girl about going to the movies. Nobody's down there threatening him. Daddy's not pulling out a shotgun and killing him. For, you know, 10 minutes after that, he's texting this girl. So, big question. One shooter or two? Two guns, shotgun and an AR. And by the way, Maggie has no defensive wounds because she's running. What's she running from? And, and could you shoot? Typically, she would be, she had a little shed right, probably 150 feet from the feed room on the other side of a wall. Perhaps she heard the shotgun blast and came around and saw somebody, or two people, um, and whoever it was opened up. Was there enough time to kill Paul? Um, and then find the AR and then ambush Maggie. Much more likely there were two people, but well, again, I, we don't have to prove anything. Let me, let me sort of share the framework in which you should examine this. You have agreed to follow the law, and here's the law. Here is the law. He didn't do it. He is presumed innocent. As you sit there right now, as you sit there right now, when you look at him, you have to believe he is innocent. He didn't do it. Now let me tell you, that's so 
difficult to do. I get it. And the way, the way, maybe the best way to explain it is this. This morning, or yesterday, nobody really reads newspapers anymore. But if you're reading the newspaper, looking at the Internet, and you read the police had arrested somebody for some heinous crime, the natural inclination of everybody, all of y'all, is to say, thank God they caught him or her. Thank God that person is in custody. And you did something that's so natural. We all do it. You presumed the police had arrested the person that committed the crime. You presumed him or her guilty. That is the natural thing to do. And you know what? That's fine for you to do. Any other day except today. Because you took an oath to follow the law. And the law is, he is innocent. He's presumed innocent. That is your presumption. Your mental framework is, he didn't do it. They've got to prove it to me beyond a reasonable doubt. And the judge also instructed the jury that anything the lawyers say is not evidence in the case. It, it just isn't. But you still listen to it to help guide through some of the evidence. So Dick Harputley in there, again, talking about the two-shooter theory. So you've got to provide evidence of that if you want to argue it at the end of the case. That's why they brought in one of their experts today. Let's take a listen. Mr. Palmback, do you have an opinion um, based upon a... Uh, more probably than not, and whether there was one or two shooters who mur murdered Maggie and Paul on the night of June 7th. I did have an opinion on that. And what's your opinion? Uh, my opinion is the totality of the evidence is more suggestive of a two-shooter scenario. And what, I mean, please explain the basis of your opinion. Okay. Um, so we'll go back to Paul. In Paul's scenario, we know where the shooter of the shotgun had to be, and that, and that would have been orientated really directly over Paul's head. And we also got a chance to see what, the, you know, what was the effect of this dynamic explosion in the contact. And you can see outside and even in throughout the feet area in multiple and many large pieces of skull. We also saw large amounts of tissue that were projected all the way up onto the ceiling and the door. You see hair all the way up in, into the door. And, of course, you see blood literally everywhere within there. And finally, you see the pellets. The pe you know, some of the pellets are on that same pathway, and they had enough inertia to either and or dent the door and, and you know, uh, put themselves up and stick into the casing. All of that activity was in direct alignment with the shooter. And so I think minimally, minimally, that shooter uh, is getting covered with this material, getting more or less the shock wave of that effect, and more than likely getting hit with at least something uh, that could have done injury, a bone fragment and or a pellet fragment. Therefore, I think that particular shooter, for a brief period of time, is, is kind of out of this. It's not as if they can instantaneously suffer that drop the shotgun, run to wherever the AR, uh, uh, the blackout rifle is, pick that up, and then, and then in, in any kind of a, a reasonable time period, engage in uh, a, a meaningful assault, an effective assault, able to shoot straight and, uh, and make hits. So that, I think, is one of the major indicators um, of concern. I think the other things to consider is that all of this is, is very temporal. It's very close. I know when I looked at the photographs versus being there, I'm like, it is much closer together um, than it looks like in the photo. So it is happening very close. With Paul, I, as I articulated, I, I believe he was shot first. I believe he had no idea it was coming. Um, and, and he took the shot to the chest and, and very soon thereafter, the one in the back of his head. Anybody in the near proximity to that, if Maggie had been anywhere in that area walking around down there, she would have heard that. Um, and, and her response would have been in the direction of the shooter or the activity or, or run or do something different. So I think that the temporal location suggests that these things more probable than not happened fairly quickly and, and, that, uh, and that the individual who shot first with the shotgun minimally was stunned, 
probably blood and material in his eyes and maybe have been injured and, and would have taken some degree of time to recover. And lastly, I think there is just a more or less a, a, in, the, in the, anybody who deals with firearms a logical argument here. Why would you bring, why would one shooter bring two long rifles, two long weapons to the event? You can't handle and shoot two of them. So you either got to put one down, use one, or, and then swap out and grab the other one. Or I suppose you could have one on a sling, but that's quite awkward and it's slipping around and it's banging around in an environment we know is very, is very, very tight. Finally, if one of the weapons is the Blackout 300, well, that comes with a, a, a high magazine capacity. Uh, my, my research of that showed that, that the, the Palmetto State Armory upper, which, that, which we don't know, we have no idea what gun this is because it hasn't been identified, but if the state, I think, has alluded to that, if that's the case, then a weapon that had that Palmetto State Armory in a 300 blackout, could a person could purchase a 10-round capacity clip, a 20-round capacity clip, or a 30-round capacity clip. Um, where I live in Connecticut, we are really restrictive on what kind of weapons we can have and what kind of clips we could have. We'd have to, even if we could have an AR, which is very restrictive, we'd have to get a 10-round clip. Other than that, it wouldn't make sense for anybody to buy a 10-round clip when you could buy a 20 or 30. But having said that, if it was a 10-round clip, there were only eight shots fired. You still had two more to go, and you could have more than not easily reloaded. So to me, there's structurally difficult for the same shooter to have two long arms and no practical reason for that to happen. Add that to what I believe happened to the shooter who fired first with the shotgun, and I think it tips in favor of the probability of two shooters. Mr. Palmback, the person who shot Paul, was he or she standing in the feed room at least one foot? Yes. Two shooters, not one. Now, you might say, okay, the defense expert, of course they're going to say that, right? And, you know, he battled the experts in the courtroom all the time on court TV. However, let's go back. Let's connect some dots now. Don't forget Dick Har Harputlian's cross-examination of a state witness. A state witness. And how he got her to agree, hey, yeah, that's another reasonable alternative. Keyword, reasonable. Let's watch. Is it a possibility that there are two shooters based on the data you collected? I just indicated there's movement between. Movement from here all the way up to here? I don't know that it went all the way up there. But is it, is it, look, I'm not telling you. I mean, one, one explanation would be movement, correct? Yes. One explanation would be, would be two shooters. I'm sorry? Yes? I wasn't there. No, 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 no. But one explanation of this data would be two shooters. <coughs> one explanation, not the. But one. Not the only one. Yeah, not the only one. But it is a reasonable explanation, just like one shooter running up that way, correct? Sure. So a re one of the reasonable explanations is there are two people there, there are two guns there, one's a shotgun, one's an AR, and we now see that that AR is being shot from way up here, correct? I can't see that though. It's somewhere along that line. And that line goes a dozen, two dozen, three dozen yards from the feed room, if you follow it straight up. I don't know where they were within that line. Could someone have been a lookout there? They went there to kill Paul, and and uh, that's the lookout. Maggie surprised them. They thought she was gone. I have no idea. Reasonable, though, right? Right? I have no idea. I wasn't there. I know you weren't there, but none of us were there. She wasn't there, but... You know, during his closing argument, Dick Harputlian's going to say, remember the state's expert, she was on the stand, and, and, and I asked her, is that, is that another reasonable alternative explanation? Magical words, reasonable explanation, reasonable doubt. That's what he's going for. Those are the dots he's going to try to connect at the end of the case.